In today's show, it's time for another ADP battle, this time with Dan Besbris from Hoopball, Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast your first listen. We are free and available on all platforms. Before we get into this ADP battle, you saw one earlier today with Alex Reclean. We're doing with Dan Bresbus today. Announcement. Now, I've just forgotten the time. Uh, when, uh, let me bring up my calendar, actually, because I've just forgotten everything that I was going to say with uh, that announcement. But ne- next week, Wednesday, US time, um, 7 p.m., that's it. No, 4 p.m. Try again. Wednesday, the 13th of October. Yes, Wednesday, the 13th of October, 4 p.m. Eastern. On the YouTube channel, there will be a live stream, a fantasy basketball telethon, so to speak. We'll be going for hours, four hours, four and a half hours, three hours, whatever, whatever we need to do. And I'm going to be on there answering all the questions that you have leading up to the last weekend of fantasy drafts, but it's going to be me. And I'm going to be joined by Dan Bespris. He's going to come on for a bit. I'm going to be joined by Alex Reclean. He's going to come on for a bit. I'm going to be joined by Adam King. I'm going to be joined by Zach Hanshu. I'm going to be joined by Mike Catron. Um, and we might have others come in as well. I'll have some, probably some people from the Locked On Podcast Network about their teams. Also, just guys dropping in and out as we answer your questions on the live stream. We'll go for as long as we need to go as a big, big, um, just answering questions. Basically like an AMA, but we're doing it live on video and it'll go for yeah, quite a bit of time. So that's Wednesday, the 13th of October, starting at 4 p.m. Eastern on the YouTube channel. Be ready for that big uh, fantasy basketball thon that we are going to do over there. So let's get to this ADP battle. Let's talk to Dan and, uh, and bring him in right now and discuss some of the players that we're going to discuss. All right, so it's time for me to bring him in. It is time for the ADP battle with Dan Bespris. Daniel Bespris Jr., welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I haven't had any hotel exploits yet, but uh, <laughs> working a, on my game here. Well, it's early in the day here. I don't know what's happening yeah. for you over there tonight, but uh, good luck with that and good luck with your future family endeavors after one of those hotel uh, Daniel House style uh, <laughs> it, moments. But we yeah, hit is it. it too soon for that joke? I don't know. Uh, we, people probably don't even know what we're talking about, or even though it was, only, it was about a year ago. But so much has happened in the interim. We're ready for another NBA season, Dan. And we're here to do ADP battles. And as I said on the show earlier today, Speaking with Alex, it's not just it's about like, you know, these are the ADPs necessarily this player is going or we understand that if we wait on certain guys, we can get them at different spots. It's like, here's two people. We're going to make a decision at this point. Who are you going to pay t- take out of these guys? And a lot of it comes down to personal preference, how you like to build a squad, what you like to do, whether you're not seeing an improvement or you're seeing a decline from this guy, a lot of different factors. So it's basically just like this guy versus this guy. What do you want to do based on how you think? And Dan, what is your overwhelming thought process when you're building squads? Yeah, so I I would say the thing that I get suckered into the most that pulls me out of my thought process is starting to worry a lot about individual categories as I move through. My, my strictest idea, the one that I want to try to adhere to the most, is best player available. I do a lot of nine-cat, roto, games-capped formats. So uh, there's so much time to move players during the season we get lost in this, like, what's the best pairing mentality? Oh, yeah. And I feel like you, when you go pairing, I feel like that should be a, okay, do I have to do this? Not, this is the one I want to get to. Uh, and so, yeah, for me, it's it's I just want to take a guy that I think is going to be a really good value at a spot. I think it, uh, the pairing question is one. Like, uh, the number one question, I don't know where you sit on this, Dan, but the number one question I get is, who do I take in the first round? I'm at pick six. Who do I take? I'm at pick three. Do I take Harden or Curry? And my answer is just like, whatever. Like, it doesn't actually matter 
that much at that spot. Then it'll be like, well, who's the next one? Who do I pair with Jokic? Who do I pair with Curry? And that's the second most popular question. And again, it's it, it's important. I think the, the part of that question is more who don't I pair with versus who do I pair? Because there's a number of things. But it's like looking at like a a decision tree or like a you know royal family lineage tree where you have your first pick then it can break off into a couple of different options and then each time you go down it just wildly wildly changes based on who you get in each round prior to that so th- those decisions about pairing and what categories you need when comes down to what you're doing with your seventh pick or with your ninth pick or with your tenth pick versus that first or second guy whatever you choose there then impacts what happens later on but it's not like it's an absolute guarantee you've got to get this one player with this first guy that you took yeah you don't need to i I think there's this innate desire to like cover all eight or nine categories in your first two picks you have to be good at all of them after two or you can't after that and i just don't i don't think that's true you can be great at five or six and like not great at one or two and okay at one and there's so much time left to do it. If you have good picks in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round, you're, you're, the whole complexion of your team can still change. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's fun, actually, to think of it like that, where it just keeps branching out an infinite number of possibilities. Yeah. But again, there's like there's these narrow paths where you probably should pair a little bit, but it's it's... It's like one, maybe two situations out of so many. I think the pairing importance increases each round you go. And, and it's like... You know, in that first round, it's more uh, who do I avoid now? That that situation's not as, um, you know, in, in the past it always used to be like if I've got Harden, I'm not adding Drummond because it's just taking away Harden's best category in his free throws and it's putting you average to below average when you want to just stack on to and make that category really good because what have you wasted there with that? But th- that sort of situation doesn't exist as much anymore. There's no, there's no this your terrible terrible free throw guy in the second round maybe at Zion but even then I'm not, I'm not certain that that's the case and he's probably not even there in that position so it's not there's not as many of those must avoid pairings and that's the way I like to look at it in that second round versus you know, who do I need to get and you said you know you don't need to go and get all nine categories good after first two picks that's that's true and you also don't need to be like well I'm just going to make sure all six categories are amazingly good in those first two and the, and forego everything else or get five categories only and just build them up it's it's really that decision making comes more into play later in the rounds I think and I think that's just something that in terms of general strategy which is not really what we're talking about in this show but I thought it was worth no, um, love- worth mentioning that sort of thing when we're discussing this we'll get into that first one in a second but if you are new to fantasy basketball and you don't want to deal with categorical scarcity and just want to play like a, a points league with your family with your friends and, and guys at work sleeper is a new app to fantasy basketball it's been around for fantasy football for a few years a very very clean and easy to use app very easy draft room they've got third round reversal you can do dynasty and keeper and redraft leagues they also have their exclusive game pick format now that's the only format that they have on the site but what it means is that you go in there and you only pick one game for each player each week. So don't worry about streaming or who's got more games each week. You just pick the one game for each player using their points format and their game pick format. So if you've got people you're trying to bring into fantasy basketball, go and get them in. Start a league on Sleeper. Try it out today and uh, see how you go. All right, Dan, let's go to the first one of these ADP battles. <sighs> All right. Oh, boy. Here we go. Fire up the pitchforks, guys, at pick number 15. <laughs> now, let's, let's, let's get something clear. Luka Doncic is probably not going to be available at pick number 15. Almost definitely. And almost definitely, you do not have to pick Rudy Gobert at number 15. He will not be in the discussion point there. But I picked number 15 right in the middle here because you sent me a list of how you're valuing guys and you had Gobert over Doncic. And yeah, but my my eyes fell out of my head and went, oh, this is going to be great to talk about. This is, this is awesome. <laughs> so yeah, Doncic isn't there at 15 in most cases. You don't need to take Gobert at 15. But if Dan, if some absolute fucking psycho comes in and goes, Dan, this is a fantasy draft. If you don't pick, I'm going to fucking kill you. And he had to say between Gobert and Doncic, why are you taking Rudy Gobert? Oh, man. Okay, so I got I to gotta dig deep for this one. And the answer is largely because I am a nine-cat roto guy. Yes. Um, if you're in a head-to-head eight-cat format, don't do what I'm about to tell you to do uh, because turnovers is, is the biggest area of difference basically between those two guys. Um, I like Rudy Gobert for a couple of reasons. And again, like you said, you're not going to have to take him at 15. I, mostly I've become kind of the Rudy Gobert guy because I've been like, look, I've been stuck at about pick 24. I don't know who to take there. Oh, it's a like, shit you know, I'm just going to take Rudy like four or five slots too yeah. early. 
and people are still getting on my case. So now at 15, I know the the the, the natives are restless. Um, wait, wait a second. People are getting on your case for taking Go Bear at 24. Uh, I mean, that's a shit area of the draft. Like, what's wrong with taking Go? He was 27th last year in eight cat. Like, what's what, what the hell is wrong with Go, Go Bear at 24? There's nothing wrong with that. People just. I guess people look at it's it and look, the, the low scoring is a part of it. And I understand that part of it because finding points, bulk points later on is pretty tough unless you find yourself getting Colin Sexton in round seven. But that's you know one in 12 chance unless someone else grabs him. Like You can be in real trouble of competing in that area. But Rudy Gobert at 24 is not outrageous. But anyway, back to you, you him at 15 over, over Doncic. Yeah, so this, this one's going to be a tough sell and I'm going to do my very best here. Um, Rudy has now, after alternating... Uh, seasons where he missed about 20 games with weird injuries and then playing full seasons for roughly about four years, the last three in a row, he's been a pillar of durability. And for me, my first and second round picks, obviously you want them to be very good. You're not going to just go take someone who's healthy from way farther down the board. But at nine cat last year, Rudy was number 20 or 21, depending on, on what metrics you're using on a per game basis and played in 71 out of 72 games. And I believe He's missed six total games over his last three seasons. That's a really big deal. Your first two rounds, you want those guys out there. The other thing is, because you're generally taking Rudy in that 20 to 24 range, he is probably getting paired up with one of the best free throw by volume guys in the league. So nine cat Roto, yeah, that pushes you back down towards kind of league average in that category, but you can buttress it in the third. I don't think I've sold everybody yet, so I'm going to try to go a little bit deeper. 2.7 2.7 blocks per game is outstanding. He almost single-handedly takes care of that category head-to-head or Roto. 13 and a half rebounds, same story. People see 8.2 field goal attempts per game, but his 68% shooting actually made him the second best weighted field goal percent helper for fantasy teams in the league last year behind Zion and somehow actually just ahead of Giannis, who took 18 shots a ball game. So there, you know, the math says that Rudy beat the pants off of Luka Doncic in nine cat last year. And I know you watch any of these games and that doesn't make any sense. It's kind of the same, like how is John Morant not inside the top 200 kind of thing. Uh, But that's what happened. And Rudy was number seven by totals last year. To me, that's really valuable. And hopefully I've convinced one out of 20 of you to, to jump on my side. I reckon you convince convince zero, but everything you're saying is 100% correct in you're terms right. of... You're actually, so that's right. not true. It, it's not 100% correct. Because uh, let, let me just throw a couple of rebuttals. We'll talk about Doncic just briefly in a second. Um, you mentioned... Well, actually, what you said is 100% correct in that Gobert has missed six games over three years. To me, that is no indication that he will miss two games only this season. Like That, that to me means oh, maybe he's going to actually get hurt. I don't know, that's not how this sort of stuff works. But to me, that does not indicate that he's not going to have a freak injury of breaking his hand or twisting his ankle or tearing his meniscus. He's 29 years of age. He just played at the Olympics. And you know, three years of health means oh, maybe something's going to go wrong. Like that, that, that's, that's where I was. So I don't look... I have issues with injuries in terms of players who have got persistent problems with one part of their body. And even then, I, I can't sometimes can be forgiven there. But someone who's just stayed healthy, it just... No one is made out of impenetrable, unbreakable adamantium, vibranium, whatever you want to say. Like no, nobody can do that. So that I worry a little bit about about that with um, with Gobert. But what you mentioned with the free throws, this is not like what I said earlier about Andre Drummond, who used to th- shoot thirty eight percent from the line. Like Gobert is bad, like 66 percent. But adding him to a Harden or a Lillard brings you to mid pack. But the pri- prior scenarios, prior years, when you added Drummond it took you to being second worst by getting the worst free throw guy or getting the best free throw guy in the league and you somehow still be the second worst free throw guy. So it is a very different story in that area. And you're right, Doncic has poor free throws as well, but he kills you in that turnover category um, as well. I just think that the value of um, points and assists are so high. And if you don't get them very early on, you can almost kiss them goodbye, Dan, which I'm sure that it's very hard to get those good numbers later on, especially without hurting other areas significantly. And that just pushes me a little bit, uh, it pu- pushes him a little bit ahead of me there. And I, actually one other thing, I, want, I don't want to be too negative towards you, Dan, but one other thing, <laughs> this, is a, this is a phrase that I think we're all guilty of. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it because you just said it before and you don't know what I'm going to say. But when you said it, he almost wins you that category by himself about blocks, right? We throw that number out there with that all the time. And I was just thinking when you said that, 
Okay, so on average, an NBA player plays four games per week and say he gets three blocks a week, that's 12 blocks. But normally in order to win, say, a head-to-head matchup for blocks, you need 27 to 30, right? So while it's a great start, I think, and I know you don't mean this literally, but some people can take that idea literally. It's like, I don't need to get anyone who blocks any shots after that. I'm covered. He might cover 40% or 30% of you in that category, but you, you can't fully ignore it. Otherwise, as we said earlier, you're wasting his best category. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, and, and you're absolutely right. I, I didn't mean for that necessarily to be a literal interpretation, so it is important to point that out. I think if you are even slightly sub-average the rest of the way, he probably yes. lifts you to near the top of the pack yes. without having anybody else that needs to be even necessarily good at it and so yeah. that's kind of that's a harder way of saying it um and i'll try to come up with with a more clever way to kind of put it together but yeah he gives you that unbelievable start like you said and then it it affords you the opportunity to not focus on that category as you're moving through you don't have to wonder like oh the fifth round came around or the seventh round came around i haven't grabbed another traditional center you may not need to do that the rest of the draft which does give you that that tree branching, he gives a lot of yeah, really interesting opportunities. Um, one one other thing on the Gobert front, and and picking at fifteen is is part of what makes this such a a fun discussion, but also a difficult one. If you're picking Gobert at fifteen, he might not then end up getting paired with one of the best free throw shooters by volume in the league. Because now you're talking about what is that the ni- ninth or tenth pick in the first round? My math is yeah, it's the tenth tenth tenth. tenth. Yep. Um, so your guys like Dame, Steph, Harden, those guys are off the board already. So now you're pairing Gobert it might with be a, a good foul shooter. It might be but a Tatum, not a Tatum or a Paul George, one. maybe. Tatum or Paul George or Bradley Beal, maybe. Who have, who had all... Yeah, I guess PG was pretty good. Yeah, the, okay, but none of those guys were quite Steph Dame level. No, because they're not. And, the volume's not quite there at the same. Right. Level. So so now in the third, you're sort of you're kind of forced to look back at free throws again because the good foul shooters dry up really fast after the top 25 or 30 or so. So I don't think I would actually in real life advocate taking Gobert at 15. I just really like him as an end of second round pick because the math all says nine cat Roto, he will probably crush it there. Yeah, and that's and that, if that's how you're viewing it, then that's absolutely true because he does help in those areas. And that is uh, important to note. Let's go on to the next one, Dan, before we get sidetracked too much. Let's go all the way down. Let's go down to number 60. Is that you, Mr. Stewart? Well, who the hell else do you think it'd be? Get in here, you pair of flaming galahs. Ah, yeah, the flaming galah, Isaiah Stewart. He's available at pick 60. Now, I was looking back to an article that I wrote at the start of uh, August about some early Yahoo sleepers, and I was looking at some of their things, and yeah, Isaiah Stewart was ranked 120th. And as happens so, so often, he is now coming all the way, and I think he's in at 51 now on uh, on Yahoo. So he's all the way in, which pisses me all the way off. Because again, he's a guy that I looked at and went, all right, guys, smash this. This is ridiculous. You got to get it. And yeah, they notice what people say. I don't know how you ever come to the conclusion to put that out at 120 to begin with, but that's a separate point. Let's assume that Stewart is around at pick number 60. Let's also assume, which we don't really have to because he's going to be around at this spot in most spots anyway, Robert Covington is available at number 60. Dan, is this another one of those I am... Um, I'm just uh, jerking off over his low turnovers. Um, you might want to want to phrase bit. it that way, but you, yeah, you know what I mean. A little bit, yeah. I mean, this is this is also a, a tough one for a similar reason, I think, because you are kind of reaching up the board at this point for Covington to take him yep. at 60. He'll be around, I would think, at 80 in a lot of drafts. Certainly at 70. Yep. Uh, I, quietly last year, I thought he had a really nice season. Got off to a slow start and got dropped in a lot of places. Much turned better, it on much better than you McCall- think uh, admittedly McCollum and Nurk were out and that kind of helped him get his rhythm with that team and so I don't think that his role is going to be as big this year um, I see him actually as more of like a 75 range per game guy uh, I think that Portland's going to be making a pretty good push this year I expect him to play through some of those nicks and bruises so that's kind of where I get that games played handicap and I have him beating the league average in games played just by a couple, but that's enough to push a, a kind of a sixth, seventh rounder into that fifth, sixth range. So it's hard for me to necessarily say to take him over Stewart, but if I was going to make the case for it, I would say it's a, it's a very safe pick. He's not going to decimate you in any one spot. We don't know that that might come into play with Stewart. I actually, 
I, you know, I really liked Isaiah also. I was in the same boat as you thinking, oh, interesting. There might be a couple of centers on this team that have low ADPs that, that oh, yeah. beat them. Uh, but he's rocketed up the board. And just now, the discussion for me is, I'm probably more willing to spend a seventh round pick on Rocco than a, a fifth or sixth on Isaiah Stewart. And I know that's not the ADP battle. I kind of screwed up, screwed this one up. So sorry about that. No, but it's, it's worth the debate. Okay, and I think Stewart is actually moving into the territory of, I reckon it might be getting too high and it happens every year with the guys. And then you, know, you and, I, and I say this a lot as well, Dan, that people, it's impossible for everyone to listen to every single word that I say. Like I struggle to listen to every word that I say. So, you know, they might have heard me say three weeks ago, man, I love getting Isaiah Stewart. And then they're looking at it and they go, man, is it 51? Josh said get Isaiah Stewart, but I, I don't. Like, I don't get in there. I, w- I think that I would rather let somebody else deal with that because, yeah, maybe he's a top 40 player, maybe, but maybe not. And I, there's no value in that. But when he was at 120 and then when he was at 90 and then when he was at 70, then, yeah, I loved it. But maybe at 51, I'd probably just let, let that slide because that means if he's moved to 51, someone else has pushed back a bit and giving me a bit of value in that area. Now, Covington, what, what I think what you really highlighted there was key to me. And you said that, yeah, he, he started off terrible and, and he was terrible. And so many of his big numbers the prior year in Houston was when they were playing him at center. And we saw the discrepancy. Rebounds up, blocks through the roof, field goal percentage up when he played at center. When he played at the three or the four, all those numbers down. And when he went to Portland last year, I was like, oh, no, I'm worried. He's not going to play any center. It's going to be Nurkic. It's going to be Cantor. So how are the blocks? How is all that going to look? And then, Dan, that's exactly what happened to begin the year. That stuff was non-existent. And then Nurkic went down. And then not only... Like, he didn't play as much center. He played some. But when he's out there with Cantor, Cantor's not touching the rim. He's not protecting it at all. So Covington, functionally, was defensively protecting the rim. And that enabled those numbers to come back up. Now... If Nurkic is fully healthy and they're going to play Cody Zeller or Larry Nance there, I'm a little bit worried if we're not going to see first six-week, two-month Robert Covington for a longer stretch this year. I think he's confident. So I think he built a a position with that team that he can slide into pretty nicely. So I'm not... It's hard to say I'm not worried at all because he's unbelievably streaky and I, a Rob Covington drop from like four years ago is the move that haunts me more than anything in the history of my fantasy basketball. You probably remember the season he got off to like seven weeks. He shot about 31%. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, I, thought, I think right, that happens well, every right. year, doesn't it? Uh, pretty much. And then this one had happened again. I thought, no, I'm not going to make that same mistake. We're hanging on. That 30% is going to come up to 40 um, he's not going to take as many shots. It's not going to be Houston, Rob Covington. It's going to be more like pre Philadelphia, Minnesota, Rob Covington, um, and just take a little bit of the sting away more steals, fewer blocks rebounds will be more like in the five to six range as opposed to higher than that. But that's still probably a, a sort of 80, 75, 80 per game guy, uh, with a really safe floor. Cause he's going to play somewhere. They, they like him and they need him, um, uh, with minimal upside though. I'll, I'll certainly admit to that. His upside is low. Before we get on to the next one, football season. Football is currently on at the moment. Anyone see that uh, highlight of the Rams punter? Me and Dan were just discussing that before. If you don't know, that uh, Rams punter, Michael Dixon, is an Australian. He's an Australian rules. He played Australian rules football growing up. So that move that he did when he had that punt blocked and then goes and scoops it up and then just swings around and kicks it again, that is just stock standard AFL stuff. I'm a little disappointed he didn't throw it onto the opposite foot and just uh, and ping it down the line there. That's what I would have done. I would have just thrown it onto the left and and launched at 50 down the side. But uh, football's back. And the number one place to place your bets is, of course, Bet Online. It is the number one spot for all pro and college football action with a new updated site and interface. Bet Online has more odds, props, and contests and continues to be your number one source for everything football. So if you head to their website or use your mobile device to sign up today, you can get a welcome bonus of 50% by using our promo code Locked On from football, basketball, boxing, or even your favorite Vegas casino games. Bet Online has everything you can take advantage of for the upcoming season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet Online is where the game starts. And of course, while you're watching your football games, why don't you get yourself a built bar? It is the delicious protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar, whether it's raspberry flavor or orange or strawberry or cookies and cream, whatever your favorite flavor, built bar is going to have something that you're not only going to like, you're going to love it. These are also healthy. 17 to 18 grams of protein, 130 to 180 calories, 4 to 5 grams of sugar, and 4 to 5 grams of net carbs on these bars. So healthy, delicious, and now you can get them at 15% off. So head to built.com, use our promo code LOCKED15, and you will save 15% off your order. Built.com for Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar ever. Dan, we are going long here. We've got three more to do. Let's go back to pick number 40. 
let's talk about Jalen Brown, who is probably like a mid to late third round, early fourth round guy. Just depends on, on where you're drafting. Versus Jonas Valanciunas, who was really good last season. A guy I've been a big proponent of for plenty of seasons. I am a little worried about how he is utilized in New Orleans. I'm probably less worried, especially early on now that Zion's hurt, because I think they would have gone to a lot more Zion center type lineups. Um, he's not a part of their future, I don't think. They'd like to see Jackson Hayes there, but you're pretty, feeling pretty confident about Valanciunas for this um, upcoming season. Yeah, so I had that same concern right after the trade, and then I went back and I looked up how much Steven Adams actually played for New Orleans last year, and it, it was way much. more than I than I expected or oh, really? realized. How, how, what, did, what, what I can't remember what he played. What did he play? I was I was trying to look it up, but that's why I'm blooping and and yeah. bumping in the background because it was so terrible. But he played 28 minutes a game last year. Shit. Uh, I know. I didn't think that happened either. In the moment, I thought this dude's barely playing. Uh, it just that he was a horrible fit and wasn't very good. Yeah. Um, this this was the one that when you said when you told me we were talking about it, I said I was going to have the toughest time with because I actually have these two guys within about five slots of one another on my own board. So I think this one is in reality probably a coin flip. Um, I just really like JV for to get nice percentages out of a big man, which is a weird thing to say after arguing for Rudy Gobert. Um, he's just extraordinarily consistent. Uh, Jalen Brown really does sort of tip more towards the scoring categories and steals i find steals to be pretty easy to come upon his free throw percent is a little bit lower for a guard which i'm not a big fan of i think they will have very similar seasons i just don't have that massive fear with with jv and i think it's pushed his adp down the board a little bit because like you said brown is going in the mid to late third and valanciunas about a round round and a half later which to me is related probably to that fear for a guy who ended up right around the top 30 last season. So I like JV a lot, even if his scoring comes down a little bit. He does enough other stuff uh, that I like his game a lot. I think he was, you can correct me if I get this wrong, but I believe he was inside the top 15 for like the last month and a half last year. I don't have that in front of me, but it, he was really good. I know I know that much. Um, I've got him playing that same 28 minutes this season as Steven Adams did last year. I guess the difference is last season in Memphis, he was basically a second option. And, a fir- and at times a first option because you know, Jaron Jackson missed all season. Ja Morant missed a chunk with that ankle injury. I know Dylan Brooks is out there thieving shots as much as possible, but you head to New Orleans and Devontae Graham's going to chuck, but Ingram and Zion are clear one and two, like clear one and two. And Valanciunas slots into maybe third, maybe fourth, maybe fifth, depending on what Nikhil Alexander-Walker does because that bloke hasn't met a shot he doesn't want to take either. So I guess that scares me a little bit there even though the minutes might be the same as Steve Adams it is a little bit of a different offensive hierarchy he's obviously a better offensive player than Adams but those other guys if Graham Alexander Walker Ingram and Zion all start next to him not sure where not sure where Jonas fits in in that group in terms of where where he gets those shots but yeah I, I like Valentina still in that yeah late mid to late fourth round I probably wouldn't take him at 40 but I don't think it's outrageous to consider him in the 40 to 45 range I just would clearly have Jalen ahead of him but you're right Brown is a guy that does thrive on that good scoring he had some big steps up in efficiency there's there's no guarantee that that maintains I think it will he's not a good passer and he does not he's not the greatest rebounder but it is coming down to getting some scoring numbers and getting some steals and you are right about the steals fact you can get steals um, later on in drafts. There are plenty of guys available to get steals later on in drafts. So if you're value... And that's why when I tend to look at ranking numbers, I do tend to downplay the value of a steal because it is something that can skew values of guys a lot and can be available later on in a draft. Next one, Dan. Pick 50. I just did one with Alex about Devin Booker where he had him wildly high. And now we're hitting, heading to pick 50, which is about the zone where Booker actually finished last season. Pick 50's there. Devin Booker's available. Tyrese Halliburton's available. And you're taking Tyrese Halliburton. Yeah, unquestionably. I I mean, I think people are probably noticing a a theme with me is that I don't value points as highly as a lot of folks. It it helps flip the board in Roto if you're just, if you don't even worry about being in the top in points. If all you need is to kind of be mid-pack or even low mid-pack, you can be so good in so many other categories. And, And I like Tyrese a lot. I think he takes a step forward this year. Uh, last season, he was already ahead of Booker by a round in per game. I don't see Booker's role changing all that much. Uh, and with Halliburton, he becomes more of a feature piece this year over last season. So this one actually is 
pretty lopsided for me, believe it or not. I, I you know, Booker, he had a nice durability bump last year. Everybody on Phoenix did, and I'm a big fan of all of that stuff. But we don't really know the story with Halliburton. He might end up being e extremely tough also. So I don't know that we can even incorporate that into the handicap here. I was never particularly high on Booker. He There was a stretch there where he was the primary ball handler. Assists were coming up, and that covered up for some other stuff. But everybody drafted him based on eight games in the bubble, and that just wasn't who he was with Chris Paul nearby. Now, I do believe Paul misses more games this year. That probably puts a little bit more on Booker. Chance that makes his per-game numbers come up a little. But for me, this one's not close. I go Halliburton taking a big step forward. Uh, I think he I think he creams him on the course of the season in per-game and totals. Um, a couple of things with what you said there. You said about the, the bubble, and you write that influence people, but... Without turnovers, Devin Booker was 22nd, 18th, and 14th for the three seasons before Chris Paul arrived. So it wasn't just that nine-game run or eight-game run in the bubble that boosted. He was legitimately excellent as a fantasy player and was a fringe first-round guy, like back-end second-round guy in that 19-20 season. But what happened is his assists almost got cut in half. He went from 92 down to 87 from the free-throw line. Still great, but it's 5% fewer. He um, got to the line less as well. And you know, we saw the usage actually go up for him overall, but his overall, like his three-point shooting fell off. He didn't hit as many threes. His game just changed. And I, I do think that Booker can be better than what he was last season, but yeah. that is factoring in maybe Chris Paul misses some time. But if Chris Paul doesn't miss time, then what changes for him? I am expecting a little bit of a step up there. And this is, again, what you're valuing. I'm looking at points because I know they're hard to get later. And what you said is 100% true. If you... Take the value away from points. You get bargains on a lot of guys and you get a lot of players who slide in different areas because people focus on points. Now, I, I, I talk about focusing on points because if you don't, if you want to be competitive in that and you want to be really good in points, you have to focus on it early because there's li literally no way unless you've got unlimited moves and you're just streaming you know, two guys in every day, you can't be competitive in that category even unless you get the high scorers early on. But if you don't want to care about that too much, then there is value that pops up all over the place. And it does look like, Dan, that Halliburton's going to start this season. They've started Buddy Heald off the bench in both games. They've di done different things with Harkless starting or with Marvin Bagley starting in that other spot. But Heald is playing a high usage bench role, which is by far his best role versus whatever they were doing with him last season. So it looks like Halliburton to me, maybe this changes, but it looks like he's going to lock in ahead of Buddy Heald, which was the right move last season and they just didn't do it. So that, that does help his value. And I do think he's going to improve. I just probably would take Booker. because I've got them really close. I just going to kind of give that slight... Um, that slight advantage to the guy that might be a 26 point per game player versus a player who might average 15 or 16 points just to give me that little boost in, in those early rounds. Um, any, any rebuttal to anything I said there? Was I off on anything there? No, I mean, you nailed it. And, and this one again comes down also to value as well. Booker's generally going, he's all over the map actually, yeah, but it is. seems like 25 to 35 range this Which year. I think it's too high for him to be honest. Um, his, his rank is 25 on Yahoo. That's too high for me. I think 35 is fine, but even then there's a little bit of a risk associated with that, but I think that's probably fine. 25, there are plenty of other guys that, that I would take. Like at 25, you've got guys like um, your Michael Porter's behind him, Lamelo Ball's behind him, uh, Chris Paul is behind him, LeBron, um, Jalen Brown even, who I'd consider uh, ahead of him. Uh, Donovan Mitchell, I think. I oh, know Donovan Mitchell's a little bit ahead of him. Shea Gutis Alexander's a spot behind him. There are a few guys that I'd rather take uh, ahead of Booker rather than at pick 25. But the last one for us here, we're going to go right down the back end here. And again, this really ties into your nine category roto mindset and foregoing the points category. But pick 98. And this guy, there are times when we could have done this where Michael, uh, not Michael, the other one, Kevin Porter Jr. would be available. Because again, when I re-looked at my Yahoo sleepers list early on, he was like at 120th, which was pretty wild to see that. You... We've got Kevin Porter. We've got Matisse Thibel, who, if we assume, Dan, that Ben Simmons isn't playing and it's going to be a while before he's traded, he's in line for a larger role. Now, people are going to look at this and they're going to go, Thibel's going to average five points per game, which might even be high as an estimation. <laughs> yeah. But he is going to bring a lot. And we talked, you talked about it before. You're getting steals late. It's really easy to do. And this is one of those, one of those guys. Now, to me, it's clear that I would take Kevin Porter there. I think... He does have concerns, obviously, with turnovers, much like Luka Doncic. Turnovers, uh, free throw percentage, field goal percentage. Who knows what he does with his threes? Um, he's not a great rebounder. He's a low defensive stats player. That is all That is all 100% true. 
But Thibault is going to be that a big steals guy, a good blocks guy, whereas Porter is going to be a good points and a good assist guy. So I guess it depends on, on what you're targeting in, in this area of a draft. Yeah, I mean, you said it. I, my fear with Kevin Porter is basically all tied up in percentages. I'm actually, I know his turnovers are going to be garbage, but I'm actually more concerned. And again, it's the nine cat roto thing, I think, where in head to head, there's that week to week variance where he could just have a good shooting week mm. and great, or maybe he doesn't. And your other, someone on your team does, and it balances out in a, in a weird way where in Roto, that's just like throwing an anchor off the boat. Every time he takes it, the court shooting, he's going to get like 22 shots a game this year, probably. And he's going to hit 42% of them. The free throws, I, you know, I desperately hope those get better. I don't know that they will. It's hard to, to bank on that. He is 72 in Cleveland, 73 in Houston, do we see improvement there? Maybe. Um, so I'm just not willing to sort of sink two categories for what's going to be an extraordinarily exciting season on a team that loses a whole lot of ball games. I just, Matisse Thibault, he's actually, his rate at what he does, steals and blocks, and that's yeah. really it. I mean, you're right. If he scores five points, that's probably a win. I mean, maybe he gets up to like seven or eight in a in a magical scenario. But he's the guy you can take if you if you don't want to take Covington at 80. He's, he's the backup Rob Covington. His steal rate is insane. You watch him play, and he just gets to things that no one else in the NBA can get to. Uh, if Simmons gets traded, it seems like someone coming back would likely not take Thibault's spot. I don't even need him to take a step forward offensively. I just don't want that percentage anchor on my team. So I'm actually – I know I'm the I'm, I know I'm the old man curmudgeon every time I do anything, uh, but I, I got I got to go with the guy who's not going to kill me couple of things there. Are you older than me, Dan? <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt. I'm 38. Uh, so no, you're not. <laughs> um, or I'm 41. Um, so you're just taking on the old man persona there. But uh, I look- know. It's since I was 16, Josh, I pulled a calf <laughs> in high school and my friends called me old man Bespris and it just stuck 22 years later. I can't say I've ever pulled a calf. Yeah, that's it's, hard to do when you're 16. Yes, that is that is the definition of old <laughs> old man injury. Anytime someone pulls a car, you go, oh, that's the old man injury yep. coming out. And, and there you go. What you're saying is true. And I think the point that needs to be not belabored, but with with poor percentages is you can be poor in threes. You can be Ben Simmons in threes, right? And you don't hit any at all. But there is a flaw. Like you hit zero threes. You cannot be worse than that. Right, that is the lowest impact you can have. You can be a forty percent field goal guy, right? Let's just say the worst, the worst possible shooting player in the NBA is thirty eight percent from the field as a regular player. That's that's a fair that's a fair estimation as the worst shooter in the NBA on a regular basis, right? So you can be that, but that there is no flaw because you can be a thirty eight percent shooter on seven attempts, and then someone else can be a thirty eight percent shooter on nine attempts, and that's worse then they can be a 38% shooter on 10 attempts, and that's worse. Then they can be a 38% shooter on 15 attempts, and that's worse. Then someone can come in and say, well, you got, guess what? I'm going to shoot 37% on 10 attempts. And it just keeps going down and down. Unless you get down to someone who's a 0% shooter on 50 attempts per game, sure, that's the absolute <laughs> bottom, but it's never going to happen. So we have this flaw on the value of guys who sit in those counting stats at zero, and you can't get into negatives, but in percentages, holy shit, you can get into negatives real quick. And it's why that impact of Andre Drummond or Dwight Howard or Shaq in the past on those free throws was so bad because you know, you'd see, if we're going to take it into standard scores and Z scores, like a, a poor three-point shooter can be a negative 2.5. A poor free throw guy can be a negative 10 in those categories. And that is why those things there on high volume at that point can really kill you. Whereas Thibel scoring four points is not great but it can't ever get into those gigantic negatives. Like if Porter shoots 20 times and shoots 41% and then goes 70% from the line on eight attempts, holy shit, look, that's a big volume. And it can be, depending on what you've done earlier, it can actually hurt you more in those areas than it helps you in him getting 20 points and eight assists. I hope I explained that. Well, no, I, I thought you nailed it. I, I mean, that was a that was a brilliant explanation on the, on the zero being the absolute floor for something. I hope that, that it sinks in because... You're right. It, it it explains a weird mathematical phenomenon yeah. in fantasy where these e- extraordinary scorers are like top 150 fantasy players. And it makes no sense. What you're seeing on the court doesn't J- match around. what the rank... Exactly. Because of those types of categories where they just... 
they get overlooked and they and as the volume grows it just pulls them down the board yanking them farther and farther down until they're now doing more damage than they are helping and and that's kind of where i sit on on kevin porter if he takes a big step forward i'm gonna look like a total buffoon for taking thibel over him and that that could happen i just I don't see him taking a massive step forward in percentages, kind of the first real shot at a high volume role. Uh, maybe in the future, we might, maybe we're a year early. I don't know. Uh, but I'm an, again, Roto guy. I just, I can't have that over a whole year. I was going to say, I'll let you in on a secret, but I don't need to let you in because you know about it. And this is something to look at all the time as we talk, can talk about the, the percentages. And this is the last thing before I let you go down. You talk about the percentages having a negative impact, but then the, the inverse is true is if you take a big step forward in those categories, it's gigantic. Like it takes you forward so, so, so far. Like, so when Brandon Ingram becomes a 12 percentage point better free throw shooter and then doubles his three point volume and goes from 30% to 41% or whatever, like that takes you not five. It's not like going from, you know, one steal to 1.2 steals. It's like, it, it's you know, triple that or, or quadruple that because those categories not go from being a big negative into a big positive, but also influence other categories. So if you start hitting field goals and start hitting free throws, and start hitting threes, your three-pointers made goes up, your points made go up, plus the percentages go up. So it influences in so many areas and can be just a gigantic um, swing point. But if you screw them up, then it hurts you in multiple categories. So when someone's having a stinker, Robert Covington, 31% or whatever it was to begin the year, it hurts all of his categories, Dan, all of those scoring categories. And then when it improves, it improves all of them at the same time. Yeah. And it creates a yeah, jump from big, top big 200 to like top 20 in there. It's a, it's a crazy yeah. leap. I mean, use Andre Drummond, an example you were talking about earlier on the punt free throw side. When he went from 40% to 60% in foul shooting, he went from almost an unrosterable player to a second rounder. Yep. Yep. And, and that little bit there, instead of being four of 10 from the line, he's six of 10 from the line. All right. So that's a huge improvement there. It's two extra points per game as well. So it goes from 16 to 18 points. And that's a big change too. And that might get, you know, not as much publicity as him improving the free throws, but that's two, two points per game is important. And that's, it's a big difference. And that's why those categories, when someone's slumping or having a hot streak, often it's because of ridiculously low percentages or ridiculously high percentages. And they're going to come back somewhere in the middle at some point and reduce or improve the value of that player. But Dan, I've kept you long enough talking shit here on this show. Um, where can people find you? And tell them what, uh, what you got well, going on. You were kind enough to, to put it on the screen there. I am at Dan Vespers on Twitter. Please drop me a follow. I'd love to chat with you. I'm trying to do a much better job this year of kind of getting back into the fray. Last, uh, last two years, I don't remember them very well, but I don't think I did as much on Twitter. So this year, more on Twitter. Uh, let's have some fun together and uh, let's win some leagues, maybe punting points in the process. <laughs> Good luck on Twitter as, as you get more people there and the people uh, just you know, telling you that you're a, an asshole, racist, authoritarian bootlicker. It's great to have those people getting your mention. So I hope they all come... Uh, Come towards you, Dan. It's, uh, it should be a good time Gosh, for everybody. I cannot wait to start using the mute button more. Oh, uh, yeah. It's awesome. Dan, thank you for uh, coming on. You're going to be back on. The, I'm going to be on your show next week, and you're going to be back on this show next week as well. So we look forward to, uh, look forward to those, uh, those interactions as we, as we come forward for the beginning of the NBA season. Thank you so much, Josh. It's a pleasure as always. I can't wait. Now, I just realized that my camera had frozen and I have no idea when it was because I wasn't looking at the screen. So I do apologize for that, that the camera did freeze during that show. It's frustrating when uh, technical things happen and you're trying to do a show all at once and you don't have your eye on every screen. I need a producer here to help me out. Anyway, guys, follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app, guys. YouTube, thumbs up, subscribe, leave comments. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.